Okay, good morning class. So our lecture for today, we will be covering powders and granules. Why are they used? How are they used? And what are their implications into our future dosage formulas? So let's start with a definition. So powders and granules not only are pharmaceutical dosage forms, but they are also used as starting points for other dosage forms. So our powders and granules are actually used in other formulations. Ex uh, example is tablets and granules, uh, tablets and capsules as starting materials. So we do not make tablets in one go. We first make powders and granules, then we formulate them and incorporate them into the final dosage form, which is our tablets and capsules. So powders are fine particles that can result from the comminution of any dry substance. They consist of particles ranging from 0.1 micrometers to 10 millimeters. So the definition of a powder is uh, twofold. We have the physical definition of a powder and we have our pharmaceutical definition of a powder. So for the physical definition of a powder, a powder can be used to describe the physical form of a material. So it can be used to describe a dry substance composed of finely divided particles or the one. Uh, if you're going to describe baby powder, you're going to describe it as a fine powder. It may also be used in the pharmaceutical sense in which it is defined as a medicated powder intended for internal or external use. Powders are intimate mixtures of dry finely subdivided drugs and or chemicals. So for the definition for both the physical and the pharmaceutical, the key word here is fine. Meaning they are not, uh, they, they're not like rocks, they're not like pebbles, they're not like sand. Uh, it's fine. So if you uh, pinch a powder, it should not be uh, sand-like, it should be soft and it should not be actually palpable too much to the touch. Granules, on the other hand, are prepared agglomerates of powdered materials. They may be used for their medicinal content or they may be used for their pharmaceutical purposes. Granules typically fall within the range of 4 to 12 sieve size, although 12 to 20 sieve range are sometimes used in tablet making. So when compared to powders, granules are much bigger. You may think of granules as the size of sand, but a bit larger. So to make granules, you first need powders. So granules do not form on their own, except if the particle size is very large. Usually, granules are formed from powders that are uh, wet or were formulated to be granules from powders. So to describe our powders and granules better, we usually describe them in terms of particle size. So the USP uses descriptive terms when describing the sizes of powders. So these are official definitions from the USP. And this categorizes our particle size depending on their uh, sieve uh, quality. So. The USP, instead of using direct measurements like millimeters, centimeters, or inches, they use a system of sieves. So you can see on the picture, those are different sizes of sieves. You can think of sieves as like a filter <clears throat> in which uh, the filter size or the pore size describes uh, what type of, what classification of particle passes through. So a larger sieve size, example is 80 to 100, these have a finer particle size range, meaning they have tinier sieves compared to lower numbered sieves like 8. They have larger pores that could accommodate larger particles. So here on the screen are different, different definitions of powders of animal and vegetable drugs. When we say animal or vegetable drugs, these are crude drugs. These are not chemical drugs. So these are extractives or natural sources of drugs. Okay. So for very coarse number eight, all particles pass through a number eight sieve and not more than 20% passes through a sieve number 60. 
So before you pass any powder or granule through a sieve system, you have to take note of the weight first. Example, uh, a good example should be like 10 gra uh, 100 grams. So for it to be very coarse, all particles must pass through number 8. So 100 grams of your initial uh, mixture should pass through number 8. And not more than 20% pass through sieve number 60. So at least 80 grams must retain, must be retained at sieve number 60. So for course number 20, all particles pass through number 20 and not more than 40% pass through number 60. So in this case, if you used 100 grams, all 100 grams have passed through uh, number 20 and uh, at least at most 60% are retained in number 60. So you use actually two sieves at one time stacked together. And the other uh, particles are, uh, you can read them on your own, but for verifying, there is no more second sieve. For verifying, all particles pass through number 80, meaning nothing is retained in number 80. So if you have 100 grams, you have Number 80, once you sieve them, there should not there shouldn't be any powder left on number 80. And there is no limit to greater fineness. So that's the low, <clears throat> that's the highest uh, category for our drug for our powder fineness. Next we have our official definition of powders for chemical drugs. So these are for fine powders of chemical nature. So these are not natural sources. So usually you will apply this if you purchased a bulk order of powders from your supplier or from any uh, manufacturing company in which you purchased your powders from. So for chemical drugs, we have a slightly uh, different definition set of definitions for our powders so you have coarse fine and we have coarse fine and moderately coarse please take note that there are there is no moderately fine only moderately coarse so for coarse number 20 all particles must pass through number 20 and not more than 40 pass through number 60 for moderately coarse all particles pass through number 40 and not more than 60 pass through number 60, not, not, not more than 60%. For fine, all particles pass through number 80, and there is no greater limit as to greater fineness. So this is similar to our particle size of our natural sources, such as our animals and or plants. So we have the next part, which is the comminution of drugs. When we say comminution, it is basically particle size reduction. So it is a, these are techniques on how to reduce particle size of powders and granules. So we have different methods and types of comminution. The first one is a is called comminution or trituration. In pharmacy, we call it trituration. So trituration is basically putting your drug in a mortar and pestle and grinding the drug manually to reduce the particle size. So the type of mortar and pestle you use actually can affect the size of the powders you are going to create. So in pharmacy, we usually use ceramic, ceramic mortar and pestles. We don't use marble because marble is smooth and it cannot really reduce particle size. Next, we have the use of millers and pulverizers. These are machine-based methods of trituration. So we can use ball millers and pulverizers. Uh, more on this in your manufacturing. Next, we have levigation. So levigation is a type of particle size reduction in which you use a levigating agent. These are usually used in our ointments and creams and suspensions in which you apply a small amount of levigating agent that 
can reduce particle size and grittiness of the added powders. So this is a technique used in creating ointments like your sulfur ointment and your uh, zinc oxide ointment. So the levigating agent is usually mineral oil or glycerin depending on the nature of your formulation. And finally, you have trituration with intervention. So trituration with intervention is similar to trituration. However, with intervention means you're going to add another substance. This other substance usually is a very volatile liquid such as ethanol or any, usually ethanol or alcohol. So what you do is you add your crystals. Usually this is applied for crystals. Crystals and your uh, powders. Uh, you cannot, if you can grind them naturally, like take for example is your uh, menthol. Menthol crystals are hard to grind. So menthol crystals, if you try to triturate them in a mortar and pestle, they are very resistant to grinding. It will take you a long time. What you can do is add a small bit of alcohol. Once you add alcohol, the menthol crystals will dissolve. So once you dissolve it, you're going to continue triturating. And since these are very volatile chemicals, what happens is uh, while you are triturating, the alcohol evaporates and eventually you will be left with a fine powder on your mortar. Okay. Next, we have blending of powders. So when two or more combined or when two or more powdered substances are to be combined to form a uniform mixture, it is best to reduce particle size individually before blending. The point here is you have to triturate first each component separately before you combine them. Why? Uh, primarily because if you try to mix powders of different particle sizes, it will be hard to mix and it will eventually separate themselves into powders of large particle sizes and powders of small particle sizes. That is why it is best to triturate them separately and when they are roughly the same particle size, you mix them together to form a uniform mixture. We have different types of blending depending on what is available, how much you are going to blend and what is the consistency of the blend you're going to make. So first we have spatulation. So when you have spatulation, you basically use a spatula. You blend small amounts of powder on a pill tile or a combination or in a piece of on a piece of paper. You mix the two powders together using a spatula. You basically rub them together, cut them and mix them using a spatula. Next is your trituration. Trituration uses a mortar and pestle. So you place the two powders together in a mortar, then you triturate them. As you triturate, the powders will mix naturally, provided that they are the same particle size. If they are not the same particle size, trituration will be able to reduce the particle size uniformly. So trituration is a good method for mixing as well. It is the preferred method actually. Uh, spatulation is not so much. Next is sifting. Sifting uses a sieve or a filter. What you're going to do is you're going to place two powders on a sieve, then uh, sieve them. Basically tap the sieve until the powder powders uh, fall from the bottom and settle in your container. So that uh, the disadvantage of sifting or the advantage is you will form fluffy solutions. So this uh, fluffy, fluffy powders. When I say fluffy, this has a lot of air in between the different particles. So it will actually occupy a large amount of space or the powders will occupy a large amount of volume using sifting. So only use sifting if it is recommended for that preparation. And finally, you have tumbling. So tumbling is the mechanical method of mixing powders. You basically put two powders, two to three powders in one tumbling machine and 
if you look at the screen, that is what the tumbling machine does. It basically rotates continuously the powders until they form a uniform mixture. However, they should be of the same particle size. Otherwise, uh, you will just have a two-layered uh, mixture of different particles. So some things to consider when you're going to mix two powders together is potency and eutexia. So potency is when your powder is very potent. When we say potent, it means a small amount of drug can exhibit a large amount of pharmacologic effect. If you mix potent drugs without taking into, into consideration their potency, what you can get is an uneven mixture of your drug and your fillers or your diluents. So what happens is if the patient uh, takes a scoop of your powder, it might be all diluent and not enough of the drug. So if you're going to mix uh, potent drugs, it is best to perform geometric dilution. So what is geometric dilution? Geometric dilution is when you mix two amounts of powder. of the same weight. Basically, if you have one gram of drug to be diluted to 100 grams of powder, you don't add one gram and 99 grams of diluent at one time. Because if you do this, you will end up with an uneven mixture of drugs what you will do instead is to mix one gram plus one gram of diluent you will have two grams of mixture then two grams plus two grams of diluent you will have four grams of mixture we're going to add again the same amount we we'll have eight plus 8, 16, 16 plus 16, 32, 32 plus 32, 64. And finally, if you cannot add the same amount of diluent anymore, simply add the rest. So 64 minus 100. We have 36. So the final phase of your mixing is you will finally add 36 grams of diluent to your mixture okay so what this ensures is your one gram starting material is evenly distributed to a one gram of mixture of your diluent and this will lead to a uniform mix of your active and your diluent and you will always add the same amount of diluent to make a even mix of your drug so the advantage of this is you can make a uniform mixture of your potent powder without compromising on uh, safety. However, it takes a little bit of time and uh, you're go instead of triturating only once, you're going to triturate a lot of times. And the second thing you need to consider is eutexia. So eutexia is basically uh, the ability or the phenomenon in which there is a reduction of melting point when combined with other eutectic substances. An example of this is menthol camphor. So if you add this together on a mortar and pestle and you triturated them, uh, as you triturate it becomes liquid. Okay, These are two powders. They are powders at room temperature. If you triturate them separately, they, retain, they are still powders. However, if you triturate them together, it will start to liquefy. So this is called your eutexia. So if you ever want, if you ever want to combine two eutectic compounds or two uh, compounds that exhibit eutexia, what you can do to prevent liquefaction 
is to add a lot of diluent. You're going to add diluent to physically separate. eutectic mixtures so the point of the diluent is to, uh, uh, to act as a buffer or a layer between two eutectic mixture uh, two eutectic substances so they don't liquefy and if do if they do liquefy the diluent can still absorb the liquid product of the liquefaction so whatever happens is the active ingredients are still retained in your mixture. Next is particle size analysis or micrometrics. So this is a study or this is a field of science that uh, focuses on measuring particle size. So the main purpose of uh, measuring particle size in pharmacy is to obtain quantitative data on the size, distribution, shapes of the drug, and other components to be used in pharmaceutical formulations. Because there are substantial differences in particle size, crystal morphology, and amorphous characters between substances. So what's the point of knowing all these? Uh, these physical characteristics like particle size, crystal morphology, and how amorphous your powder is affects several factors in your formulation. So in essence, particle size can affect the following uh, property of your formulation. So it can affect the solution rate of particles. So the solution rate is the rate on which your powder becomes a solution so if you have a finer powder uh, it increases the rate of dissolution and it actually affects your bioavailability next is suspendability suspendability affects basically how fast your powders can settle in solution so if you have a fine powder and you mix them in water, if they are very fine, it might not sink at all. So it can also affect settling rate in which if you have too large of a powder, it may, uh, once you shake the bottle, it might uh, sink very quickly. So this affects suspendability. So suspendability is basically the time it takes for a powder to remain in suspension and not settle out. Next is uniform distribution in a mixture to ensure dose-to-dose -dose uniformity. If you have different or irregularly sized particles, some parts of your mixture might have all diluent and some parts of your mixture might contain all of your active ingredient. So this leads to... Uh, improper dosing next is penetrability of particles to be inhaled for deposition into the respiratory tract too large of part too large particles might not even reach the intended application site especially for inhaled powders so if they are too large it may be trapped in your cilia instead or it might not able to be reached uh, it might not even able to reach your uh, bronchi and finally is grittiness so grittiness is basically the texture of the powder so if you're ever going to prepare dermal preparations such as topical powders and ophthalmic preparations this preparation should not exhibit grittiness so when we say grittiness it is the sand like texture or rough texture of a preparation so we have different methods of determining particle size. So these are techniques employed in the laboratory to describe powders and granules in terms of the size of their particles. So first one is sieving. So we have discussed sieving earlier in which we use a 
a standard sieve and we pass through our powders and granules to these sieve systems and depending on how much of the powder is retained in each level of sieve we can describe the particle sizes of the powder okay you can also use microscopy so when using microscopy you use a specialized slide so in this uh, method samples are placed in a special slide and that special slide would actually contain a a measure uh, a sort of ruler to measure particle size so take for example this is your uh, powder you can measure the particle size based on the lines it intersects however please do take note that this is can only measure two dimensions it can only measure length or width but it cannot measure volume and our particles are 3d in nature they are not 2d you can also use sedimentation rate so sediment sedimentation rate uses a specialized apparatus in which particles are suspended and they are timed between uh, two lines and the time it takes for the particle to fall from the first line to the second line determines its sedimentation rate so we actually use a formula named our stokes law to determine sedimentation rate and with sedimentation rate you can obtain our particle size so this will be discussed on your physical pharmacy. Next is you can also use light energy diffraction in which you uh, determine particle size by determining the reduction of light reaching the sensor from the light source. Okay, so you basically place a fine powder in a laser and depending on the light, that is transmitted or absorbed, you can determine particle size. You can, is, you can also use laser holography. This is when a pulse, pulsed laser is fired to an aerosolized particle spray and is photographed in three dimensions, allowing the particles to be individually imaged and sized. You can also use cascade impaction. So cascade impaction uses a specialized apparatus in which uh, the powders are forced into the apparatus and depending on the particle size, it can either it can either be it can either bounce or be retained on each slide. So depending on the particle size is how far your granules or powders can reach so it can bounce or retain bounce or retain bounce or retain and you can actually separate particle sizes using this method however this is more of a method of separating particle sizes instead of actually measuring them but it can be also used for measuring so next we have the different types of powders based on their categories so first we have our medicated powders so medicated powders are intended to be used internally while others externally so most powders for internal use can be taken orally after mixing with water or in the case of infants with their infant formula so you can usually see powders for infants na hinahalo sa pagkain so other dry powders are commercially packaged for constitution and with a liquid solvent or vehicle so you can ex uh, example you can see powder for solution some for administration orally while others for an injection and others for use as a vaginal douche so these powders are shipped as powders and not solutions since they are packaged together with a diluting liquid medicated powders for external use are 
called dusters can be dusted on affected areas from a sifter type container or applied from a powder aerosol. So what you see on the screen is a type of sifter type container in which you can uh, sift them over a external part of your body. So if you know what face powder looks like, not press powder, huh? uh, face powder like Johnson's baby powder, those are what we call sifter type containers in which you can tap them to release the powder and the powder would uh, spray or particularly uh, spread through the air and eventually land in a specific area. So when we are dealing with external use powders, medicated powders for external use are dusted on the affected area from a sifter type container or applied from a powder aerosol. So a good example of powder aerosol is your betadine or povidone iodine uh, powder, powder spray. So when you spray it, it's not wet actually. You spray a fine layer of powder towards the affected area. Powders intended for external use should be labeled and marked for external use only or any similar label. When we have medicated powders for oral use, medicated powders for oral use may be intended for local effects such as your laxatives or systemic effects like your analgesics and may be preferred to counterpart tablets or capsules by patients who have difficulty swallowing solid, solid dosage forms. For administration, they can be mixed with a liquid or a soft food like your bananas or vegetables which are mashed. Powders taken orally for systemic use may be expected to result in faster rates of dissolution and absorption than other solid dosage forms because there is immediate contact with gastric fluids. So this could actually result in faster absorption. So if you want a faster effect from your tablet, you can crush them and take them as a powder form. However, not all tablets can uh, be crushed. So you will learn in your tablets which are safe to crush, which are safe to cut. And uh, it's not actually the downside of crushing powders and tablets is it can lead to a bitter taste in your mouth because of the diluents. So some caveats when using oral powders. The main disadvantage of an oral powder is the undesirable taste of the drug. You cannot mask the taste of a powder because if you want to mask it, you have to put in a lot of sugar, which is disadvantageous. Instead of a tablet or capsule which has a uh, coating that is tasteless, powders do not. So it can greatly affect the experience of our patient when taking oral powders. Some medications, notably antibiotics for children like powders for suspension, are intended for oral administration as liquids but they are unstable in liquid uh, in liquid form. So they are for liquids, but unstable in liquid form. So you do not ship them as liquids. What you can do is ship them separately as a powder and together with a diluting agent. So what you can do is create the solution or suspension at the time of administration or at the time of purchase by mixing, mixing the two of them together and reconstituting them. Okay, uh, You can uh, do this for your patients. You can ask them, would you like me to make the solution for you? Or you can in give the instructions to our patient on how to do them, how to do it on their own. Under labeled conditions of storage, the resultant product remains stable for the prescribed period of use, generally up to two weeks. So the main reason we use powder for suspension and powder for solution is because uh, they are not stable as liquids. So once we add water to these powders, 
they start to become unstable so they expire quickly that is why we usually advise our patients when uh, purchasing antibiotic suspensions na uh, you can use it after two weeks but you have to dispose of them afterwards so if you have some antibiotic suspensions in your refrigerator they're actually unsafe to use anymore Next you have is aerosolized powders. You can see on the screen is your inhalers. Some medicated powders are administered by inhalation with the aid of dry powder inhalers, which deliver micronized particles of medication in metered quantities. So this inhaler uh, is not continuous. This is not your paint can or paint spray. If you press on the inhaler, it will administer one dose only. It does not administer the uh, drug continuously as you are holding them. What happens is once you press the button, it administers one dose and one dose only. Next is your insufflators or powder blowers. So this may be used to deliver dry powders to various parts of the body like your nose, your throat, your lung, or your vagina. So basically, this is an aspirator connected to your bottle, okay? So once you press the aspirator or the bulb, it creates pressure and the pressure pushes out powders from the bottle to the intended part of the body. Another category we can divide our powders is through their uh, volume. We have bulk and we have divided powders. So when we say bulk powders, these are pre-packaged amounts of antacids and lactosids. It can also be your douches that are bought in large quantities. So the main takeaway for bulk is they are large amounts of powders. So examples of which are your antacids, your laxatives. You can also have your douche powders for douching. Please take note that dispensing bulk powders is limited to non-potent substances. So these are usually your uh, substances that are uh, safe to take in large amounts. Powders containing substances that should be administered in controlled dosages should be, div uh, should be formed in divided powders, in folded papers or packets instead. So this is, an ex this is an example of a divided powder. So when we say a divided powder, these are pre-packaged doses of powders for our patient. So after a powder has been properly blended using the geometric dilution method, it may be divided into individual dosing units based on the amount to be taken at one time. So this is the most common type of compounding you can encounter in the pharmacy paper tablets. So each divided portion of a powder may be placed on a small piece of paper or your chartula in Latin. So what you will do is triturate your powder and uh, calculate the dose needed for each dose and separate each dose and place them into one envelope at one time. So what the patient will do is for one dose, they will take one packet uh, and take it as, as is in their mouth or it could be added into this, uh, a glass of water to be taken. So this is your paper tablet. So this is what we call paper tablet. It can also be called your chartula. Next we have granules. So granules are prepared agglomerates of smaller particles of powder. They are irregularly shaped, but may be prepared spherical if you want them to. They are usually in the 4 to 12 mesh sieve size range. So these are a lot bigger than our powders. So we have different methods of preparing granules. We have the wet and we have the dry. So the basic method of wet preparation is basically adding a liquid to a powder. So what you will produce is a wet mass. 
And when you have a wet mass, you just have to pass it through a sieve and the sieve will form granules of the desired size. After you have formed the granules, you're going to dry them. And after drying them, you have your granules. Very simple. Another, uh, the more, a more complicated type of preparing granules is through your fluid bed uh, granulator. So this is called your fluid bed processing in which particles are placed in a conical piece of equipment and are dispersed upwards while suspended in a liquid excipient is, uh, is being sprayed on them and they form particles or granules of defined size as they settle. Okay, So basically powder is blown up, liquid is being sprayed. If the powder reaches a sufficient size, it will now start to fall. Dry granulation, on the other hand, when we say dry, uh, we do not use any form of liquid when preparing our granules. Why we use dry granulation is primarily because of we sometimes have powders that are dissolved in liquid or they are uh, degraded easily by liquid so we cannot add any liquid substance to make our granules so one method is called your rolling compactor in which the powder will be passed through a roll compactor basically it applies a lot of pressure and you will form a thin sheet of paper of powder in which it is now passed through a granulator. Okay. So basically you pass powder into a roller which applies a great amount of pressure and once it passes through the roller it became it becomes a sheet of powder. So these are all is already solid and all you have to do is to granulate them as is and you will form your dry granules. Another method is slugging so in slugging you place an, a certain amount of powder in a large cavity or a large depression and you compress them so the amount so a great amount of pressure is applied towards the cavity or the depression and you will form large tablets or slugs so these are like um, three inch three inch rolls of compacted powder and after you have a compacted powder you can now granulate them to form your desired part, uh, particle size for your granules so what are the benefits of using granules why do you need to form granules in the first place so first is granules flow well compared to powders so take for example uh, if, if if ever you've dealt with flour, it's not easy to pour flour. You have to tap them a lot. It's because a finer particle size or a small particle size causes the particles to strongly adhere to one another because of their uh, size. So they tend to stick to one another and when you're going to transfer them through flowing, it is hard to make them flow. So if you want to make them easily flow, formulate them into larger uh, larger particles since they are more easily uh, moved from one place to another. So this is unique or this is a issue in manufacturing. Since you want a smooth manufacturing line, you do not want any buildup of powders since they tend to adhere to one another. Instead of using powders, you're going to use granules. So it tends to roll from one part of manufacturing to the next. Next is their surface area is less than of granules. So uh, granules are more stable to the effects of atmospheric humidity since a greater amount of active ingredient or the powder is surrounded by other powders and they are less likely to cake or harden upon standing <laughs> we 
when we say cake or harden, a cake is something like if you have a bottle and you have a fine powder, eventually they will settle out and they may form a cake. This is called a cake. So this cake is actually a adhering, adhered, adhered powders in which they are hard to dissolve because they have stuck to one another. Even if you shake it, even if you uh, poke it with something, it will not dissolve anymore because the powder has strongly adhered to one another. So if you want to avoid caking, this is called caking. Either add an anti-caking agent or simply don't use powders at all. That is why most of our antibiotics for suspension are not powders. They are granules. Next is granules are more easily wetted by liquids than are light and fluffy powders since they tend to float on the surface. They are often preferred for dry products intended to be constituted into solutions or suspensions. A number of commercial products containing antibiotic drugs that are unstable in aqueous solution are prepared as small granules for constitution by the pharmacist with purified water just before dispensing. We have a special type of granules, what we call our effervescent granulated salts. So effervescent granulated salts are granules that, that are coarse to very coarse containing a medicinal agent in a dry mixture consisting of sodium bicarb, citric acid, and tartaric acid. The special ability of your effervescent granulated salts is when they uh, are exposed to water, they liberate, they liberate carbon dioxide resulting in effervescence. When we say effervescence, this is basically bubbling. And the effect of bubbling is it masks the undesirable taste of the medicinal agent. So that is why you, you like soft drinks. It's because of the effervescence. So if a soft drink is left uh, uh, open to stand for a long period of time, we call it a flat soft drink since the effervescence has already, uh, has already passed. You can also make effervescent powders. However, using granules have has this advantage of the large particles of granules controls the rate of solution and prevents violent and uncontrollable effervescence. So if you use powders instead of granules, what will happen is once you add effervescent powder, it, vi it rapidly reacts and you will have a lot of bubbles at one time. Instead of using granules in which you have a more controlled rate of carbon dioxide release, having a longer period of effervescence. So we have two methods of preparing our effervescent granulated salts. First is the fusion method in which one molecule of water present in each molecule of citric acid acts as a binding agent for the powder mixture. Basically, you're not gonna add water. You're just gonna mix all the ingredients together and they will adhere on their own because of citric acid, which has a natural crystal of hydration. So if you mix them together, they will naturally form granules and you will just have to sieve them together. The wet method, on the other hand, is instead of using the water of hydration, of citric acid you're going to add alcohol as a moistening agent so once you add alcohol it starts to evaporate so once you add alcohol you're going to mix the powders together and while they are wet you're going to uh, press them in your sieve and you will form granules and once the granules start to dry out uh, the alcohol will this uh, evaporate and will leave you with a dry set of granules. 
So the main, the main difference of wet method and dry method is dry method uses nothing. It just, is, it just uses the plain ingredients. While for the wet method, you apply a moistening agent, usually alcohol, to form a wet mass. And once you have the met, wet mass, you're going to pass them to the sieve. And once you pass them to the sieve, you're going to have the granules dry out. And you will have and and the alcohol will volatilize and you will be left with a dry granule okay so that is all for our powders and granules i hope you have learned something uh, please do uh, take time to read the book since there's more information in the book okay that will be all and thank you for listening